Here we go. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. We are global. And I am so happy to be here. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. I'm living in Israel and working. And my lovely, wonderful partner and co-host is Rose Hoy from Australia. Hi, dear. Good morning, Tova. <laughs> or oh, good evening, should I say? Good evening for me. Good morning yeah. to you. Yeah. Today, we've got David Ibrahim. He has got a background, it's an ISTDP psychologist, but he has got a background in yoga, meditation, EMDR. He's got a whole a arrangement of, of strategies for patients who are experiencing chronic pain and relationship issues, self-esteem issues, and all the various problems that we have. And he has graciously given us his time. We've only got him for three quarters of an hour. But I, he's going to share a little bit about his background and how he came to do this work and then give us a little idea of how EMDR and meditation and yoga, etc. cetera. Um, uh, how would you put it, David, um, uh, expresses your work? How, would that be the right way of putting it? it yeah, it it's expresses beautiful. Thank how you. Really. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, so welcome, David. Yeah. yeah. Can you give us a little bit of background about you first so that our patients and our viewers will be able to see uh, what's out there, I suppose, for them? <laughs> what's out there for them that, you know, when they are in pain and they are stuck at home and they are stuck on, on the sofa, that actually there are people out there who can help them. And David is multi-skilled. So yes. over to you, David. Yes. Oh, thanks, Rose. And, and thanks, Tov. I'm really grateful to be here and I appreciate you both. And I was sharing. You know, you have an excellent show and fantastic guests. I felt very fortunate to be part of that. And it's very generous to have <laughs> me you. on. It's very kind of both of you. Thank you so much. And putting out such beautiful information to the community, you know, to, to answer that question, Rose. Um, well, you know, my name is David Ibrahim and I'm born and raised in New York City. Uh, my, my father's Israeli Arab from Abu Ghosh and my mother's Greek. Um, and I was born and raised in Queens, uh, so that's going to complicate things in itself, but, but hopefully we don't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, 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 But you're living you know, in California. And I'm in L.A. Yeah, I've been out here like 20 years now. I'm not in Los Angeles for the last 20 years. I came a year after September 11th. September 11th, I used to own a pizza shop in Uptown Manhattan, and I grew up in a pizza shop as a kid in Queens. And, um, uh, you know, during September 11th, after that, I, I've always wanted to leave New York City. I wanted a different life. I felt like it was too crowded for me. And I, I wanted more space and nature. Uh, L.A. seemed a lot like cosmopolitan. It's still a big city. I'm a city kid. But at the same time, it has so much wonderful nature. You know, California is a gorgeous state. So uh, it was it was a good transition for me. I grew up like a kid in the neighborhood, you know, uh, uh, doing things that people shouldn't be doing, let's say. Um, but I grew out of that. And then when I came to LA, it was like a very uh, in-depth healing for me to grow out of my traumas and, you know, uh, growing up in, a, in a, a challenging environment, challenging neighborhood, traumas, pain, and, and then to work towards healing. And it's been a, a beautiful journey. And I love opening my heart up to healing. So when the both of you, you know, invited me to the show, I thought, oh, how cool, you know, that I can share something because, you know, Rose, you, you, the both of you are bringing up a healthy subject matter in the sense of having, and I think this is what's unique about our times in the, in the 21st century. This is like the, um, you know, ancient libraries of, of the past, but here we are in the present with all this knowledge and information uh, infinitely available to us, actually, if, if we have a Wi-Fi, if not, you have people, neighbor, you know, there's an incredible amount of uh, data and, and knowledge and a lot of it can be free to a certain extent. Um, and there's a sliding scale, you know, we're a very large population on earth. So a lot of people helping out a lot of people. Um, it's a really fascinating time to, for people to come out and grow and transform and heal. There's so much available. And I always tell patients, you know, when it comes down to like chronic pain or various forms of, um, you know, finding pathways to healing, just going online and looking at YouTube videos, you can get free yoga, it's extensive. Um, and, you know, yes. coming back to that, right, to this art, the healing arts, whether they be somatic or psychological uh, uh, or, or spiritual, you know, are all, all three. The ancient yogis believed in this, uh, um, uh, the, the several bodies, you know, that we have an energetic 
body, we have a physical body, we have a mental body, we have a higher alignment body, you know, a prana energy body. And there's different practices that can activate. And you and, and I, I went to Loyola Marymount University with Larry Payne. He's a wonderful, uh, a clin, uh, you know, yoga therapist. And he's the one that founded uh, the Yoga Therapy Alliance um, and a beautiful soul, really beautiful man. But it was great to learn with him and get my credentials at Loyola. I, I trained extensively in yoga and you know, I have a, this was after a, the pizza, after, after the pizza shop. This, this, this was way after the pizza. I, I've done a few things <laughs> since then. You know, I, I was a vice president, branch manager at Bank of America, and then I, um, uh, I ended up being, you know, I, I was successful in banking and managing banking centers. It was a beautiful wow. experience there. Um, and then uh, uh, ten years ago, I ended up actually uh, uh, starting to work on myself deeper, and I had a mentor who uh, uh, he was a medical doctor for HIV in the 80s and 90s. And he said, Dave, why don't you go, uh, go, go, go become a therapist or follow your passion. It sounds like you, you, know, you really love it, the healing arts. And I, I came out to LA to get into theater and uh, TV and film, but um, I trained with Larry Moss, who was a brilliant teacher. And uh, Larry sent me to therapy. Um, and he said, Dave, you need therapy. <laughs> you know? He said, it'll, it'll give sure you more access. I am you did therapy. Flipping pizzas and in the bank. I am positive that was I your totally trend. did, Tova. <laughs> totally did. You know, and and so it was because of Larry Moss. It was like 2008. I was going through struggles uh, in a little bit of a challenged place, and he said, and I was training in theater arts. And he said, Dave, go go get a good inner child therapist. You know, and led me to working on myself, which eventually I got to train with excellent doctors and clinicians. You know, I, I studied for years with Dr. Arlene Drake. She's a master of inner child work and incest survivor work. Wow. And I got I got really the honor and privilege to sit next to her for four and a half years. And I eventually co-facilitated group at times, and, and it was beautiful. And work on myself, too. You know, I went to therapy and different type of therapies. And my, my theater passion led into therapy passion. I was always fascinated with intra-psychic work. You know, so I, I would go take acting schools like the Meisner technique and the uh, uh, Stella Adler, I studied both of them extensively, the method also. And uh, and I always felt like, I don't know if I'm crazy about acting, but I love this idea of transforming as a soul, as a body, as a person, you know? And so I, th I was like, how did they discover these techniques? These are incredible, like ways to access emotions and, you know, to kind of fall into this body. You know, you can see Daniel Day-Lewis or uh, amazing actors and how they transform. You know, uh, uh, and I thought, oh, this is beautiful to apply to real life, like to, to use this to transform in real life. I don't have to just be a guy from the neighborhood. I can learn vulnerability. I can learn transformation. I can, you know, find find this healing path to open up and, and, and work on myself, which is it takes a lot of work, especially if we've been through a lot of traumas. You know, then you're going to have more work to do. But the, the beautiful you know, message here that it works, you know, like it works if you work it. It's just a, a, an amazing reality. And, and so I end up getting my license in advanced alcohol and drug counseling. I end up getting my license in marriage and family therapy. I got, you know, dual masters in trauma and, and marriage and family therapy. Wow. And then I got my certification in EMDR. I had a great benefit to train with Dr. Danzinger. And uh, he's a mindfulness practitioner and one that's well respected in the EMDR community. And you know, uh, I worked with Laura Dixon, who's a great trauma therapist. Um, I got to work out of a clinic extensively to, in two different locations full time with EMDR and it, working with trauma uh, uh, for years now, actually. And, and it's been a, a real gift. Um, and so, uh, you know, right, we come to this place to say, you know, where's this path? You know, where's the path to healing? It is, um, uh, uh, there's an old rabbi, the ancient rabbi, I forgot his name at the moment. He said, uh, you know, if not me for me, which me am I? Rabbi right? Hillel, if, now, if, you're, not for, oh, if rabbi not, Hillel. you're not for yourself, then who are you for? It's on my fridge. Right? Yeah, but it's a beautiful <laughs> If you're not for yourself, then who are you for? Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, we see it in all the spiritual arts, whether it's Islam, or whether it's Judaism or Buddhism or Christianity, or if, it, if it's just the people who are agnostic that practice same. humanitarian. All the same. Right? It's, right? it's practicing this vision of finding ourselves and seeing what are our blocks and what kind of approaches can we take to open up and let the heart, you know, live and vibrate at the deepest levels, you know, and, yeah. and I love yoga and mindfulness, right? It's a tool. It's just another tool in the kit. Some, some people want to 
hold on to tools as if they're the only thing. And I think that's where we start having challenges as humans, because then we, we lose the larger point of framework and we fall into these, you know, the dots on the map instead of saying like, well, but look at this global, you know, uh, amazing choices you have today to practice whatever you want. There's hundreds of versions of yoga and, and you know, uh, uh, and it is a tool towards wellness. And, to, and, it, and the data is there you, for the last 10, 15 years. There's several hundred clinical trial studies now that reveal a wonderful array of um, information towards oxygenating the blood and the body, opening up the heart and the diaphragm, getting the digestive organs flowing, the vagus nerve to build vagal tonality, mm. you know, and to allow people to get out of the stress and cortisol and adrenal uh, uh, traps that are sapping the body and creating chronic pain. Uh, and, and and I think part of the tough, if we look at it from an ISTDP framework, you know, part of the challenge can be the motivation that people can have, even when they're in therapy, you know, and, and, and a lot of therapists don't have the major tools like ISTDP or EMDR, the very strong, powerful tools to like shift the psyche, you know, unlock the unconscious, work through memory networks that are stuck, you know, if we, right, if they are self-punishing or punitive, and, and the, the person doesn't even realize that they're actually punishing themselves and torturing themselves and resistant to getting well. And they're reacting to old patterns that they grew up with. You know, like they're fighting this projective pain that I'm not going to take care of myself. I'm not going to be vulnerable. I, you know, I'm not going to open up it's my scary. heart. It's, it's painful. scary. It's frightening. I mean, this is where the frightening part comes, right, Rose? Well, it's not so much that it's frightening, but it's the frighteningness that keep the energy going, which is tragic, isn't it? You know, it's the fear that creates the energy. So why would I give up the fear? Because it's giving me energy. And, and that's what Davin Lu realised, that you could unlock the unconscious by putting pressure on the person. So, um, and, and release the idea that fear is helpful. Because, you know, people say, don't they, David, that, uh, well, if I give up the fear, I'll have no challenge. And they'll say things like that. Right. But in actual fact, yeah, it's like once addiction. you give up the fear. Good point. Yeah. It's a paradox. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's like addiction. Is, yeah. The people that are, are coming very... to our show, the people that are coming to our show are not, are, are the people that are, are, are in, the, in the field, but they're, they're struggling with the details or they're struggling with the whole. We're not, you know, it's, it's like they're just... You know, they're just not getting it like like the Sarno people who, oh, wait, I read the book. It's like these are the 5, 10, 20 percent okay. that just are climbing. And so can you address that a bit with some of your work? Yeah, doctor. So um, in the sense of like the struggle, you mean like the if there's people who are not the t they're not healing, like, you know, there's people that come in and they just get it. They heal. They do the work. Yeah, they're yeah, participating. Yeah. They're. They're, they're there, you know, lock, stock, and barrel. They're really, they're trying yeah, hard. Yeah. And some people are trying too hard. So, you know, they're trying too hard. And yeah, so yeah, I used to call that like... want it too bad and can't get to it. Yeah, yeah. There's an old uh, uh, analogy, and I'll answer it. You know, it's yoga uh, from the Sutras of Patanjali. It's a beautiful ancient scripture also. But there's a joke, you know, like it's made of four books, and they're very short. They're only like... a you know, uh, 20 or 30 verses. And so uh, the idea was the very beginning, Patanjali gives the answer. He's like, let go of everything, connect your higher power, you'll live in bliss. Everything will be all right. You know, and then it goes from there along a very uh, detailed approach, more and more detail for the slower student, let's say, not to say it's slower, but you know, the one that has more challenges. So by the third chapter, he's really addressing a lot of details. It's like, okay, you didn't get the first few verses, which the the adept student will listen to and be like, I got it, I'm off, I'm off to the races with this. I'm inspired, you know, I'm ready to work on myself, boom, right? But he keeps going, and going, and going, and going, you know, and and you read the text till the end where he comes back to the first few verses again. As I remember, this is what it's all about, just these first few verses, but this is the system. If you have challenges, you know, like if you look at Buddha's approach, he's pretty much, hey, focus on the... Uh, you know, on the better way of living and let go of these things that cause trauma and suffering. You're going to yeah. lessen suffering. You're not going to be healed from being human. You're going to have challenges, but this will help you, you know. But then if you don't get the basics, then you're going to have to bring out more and more, more and more. 
But um, I think, you know, you know, to address this motivation idea, we see it in substance abuse. I can use that as an analogy to kind of circle with this. You know, people will come in and depends on what stage of motivation they're in. Let's say they're in denial, pre-contemplation. They're in delusion that they can control it. Some people think they can control crack, crystal meth, heroin, you know, that they can actually control it. There's some for lighter folks, it could be just alcohol. But what well, or marijuana is a big one today where people are like, but you know, it makes me feel like this, this, and that. Like I'm okay in areas with it. It's not that bad. Um, and you know, what happens is when people suffer, they, they want to get their act together a lot of the times. Like that's the sad thing, is that you people gotta suffer and hit a bottom. You know, they don't and sometimes these substances prevent the front of the brain executive functioning from working properly, so they can't empathize, yeah. they can't see their loved ones suffering. Because usually that's a big turn. Like if a spouse is like, you got to go get sober. I'm tired of this crap. You know, some, you know, if somebody really cares and loves their spouse, they're going to say, oh, my God, I need help. But when people are in denial, you know, denial is a, is, is a, is a very, very uh, sad you know, place to live in. But it's um, a very powerful it, place to live in, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's a powerful. I think when people denial wake is so up, powerful. it's powerful. Yeah, and it, yeah. and when, and those are the moments where they start turning. Like you're helping them with the denial and opening up their window, of, so they can start yeah. looking around their stuck points, you know, and helping yeah. them see. And then that can actually get the motivation levels cooking in, in from addiction. But in terms of trauma, it's the same. Somebody comes in, you know, they start they start seeing defenses showing, their avoidance patterns. In EMDR, some people want to get well, but then they never get to the EMDR work. This is a pretty normal phenomenon for EMDR therapists where the patient will just bring in crisis after crisis. Never get to the belly of the beast. Don't get to the reprocessing, you know, and it takes a lot of navigation skills to help a patient strengthen their coping skills, build their support levels around them, and then get to the trauma work so they can get relieved of these toxic wow. ways of living. Wow, interesting, okay. interesting point. Yeah. Interesting point. And there's doubt. Besides denial, there's this doubt, like... Can I really be helped? Um, am I worth it? Am I? Is it worthwhile? Um, you know, yeah, what if I get right, worse? The <clears throat> yeah. yeah, the resistance, and there. Some people get really used to staying stuck, or you know, what we would call being victimized. Let's say where they get trapped in victimhood, yeah. uh, or or and they don't see. You know, they don't. They actually get stuck in externalization, so they're blaming everybody around them, but they don't want to look to themselves. And that can be one of the most difficult patients to work with is the one that doesn't want to look inward to see, because the only thing you can change is that which in you, with, with, you know, which is within you for the most part. I mean, you can go ahead and do a lot of stuff outside of yourself, but when it's coming down to inter, interpersonal dynamics and you're in a family system and you have to deal with the family members around you, you know, I get a lot of younger folks that they have narcissistic parents or substance abusing parents, parents that are wealthy, but don't care about their child's, you know, choice of living or if they're gay or lesbian or whatever it is, you know, they're not accepting or they don't accept their ways of being or, or their openness in life. Uh, and then what happens is they, you know, that person can be set up to fail themselves. You know, the part of them doesn't want to get well. They have all this pain that they don't want to face and they live in the fear instead or in the hate, you know, these extremes, fear and hate. What a, what a trap place to live. Where is the love and the freedom? You know, and the yeah. ability to be open so how and can to you be self these kind of people? Where do you go? You know, because we all we all feel like the wait a minute, like I've got this insight to help them. I've got this tool. I've got this insight. Like, where do you go, David? When this because this is this is the world is 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 rotating fast lately. <laughs> yeah. you no, know, people are just um, you know waking up and we're seeing a lot of pain and suffering where do you go david with this these kind of people yeah it depends on the person let's say they're muslim and they are a, a queer muslim let's say or you know gay muslim and they're part of their issue is 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 that then you know it's to support and help them you know find an open community and, a, and an availability in life that they they can have love and compassion even from uh, people that are religious that they shouldn't have to limited same with orthodox jewish sometimes you know somebody comes in and they're coming in from an orthodox jewish family and there's a lot of conservatism involved you know and then they struggle because people you know at our core we're social beings we yearn for family and this kind of tribal communal environment you know we yearn for each other we yearn for love we're, we're wired for it um, and when we don't have it from our immediate family that could be very painful and, and um, it so it depends painful. on you know it depends on what people are bringing in i'm always assessing the patient for 
traffic coming in. I usually like to use ISTDP immediately to see what defenses and resistance is coming up and, you know, the transference issues and what's the projection possibly or, you know, where are there blocks that I can immediately help unlock a bit and get some breakthroughs and clear out whatever's in the unconscious from there, help them get in touch with their feelings. Um, most people are going to fall there, uh, but it depends on what they're bringing in. Sometimes I have people that are coming in just for addiction. Sometimes people, I like to work with autistic adults, you know, so some people are coming in and I use a mixture of like EMDR, ISTDP, kind of light versions to see and see how does their nervous system respond because everyone on the spectrum is there's no one the same you know just like one borderline personality is not the same as another one they might show markers but it's same with autism there can be certain markers but some people are fall in different places you know of intensity and or mildness and so i'm always assessing i, I love to assess 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 constantly testing and, and kind of psychodiagnosing what are they presenting with and then looking at my toolkit, like where can I go to help them? If somebody brings in a Tesla, I'm not going to use a diesel engine to tools to work with it. If somebody you know, brings in a diesel truck, right, I'm going to use diesel tools to work with it. And I'm the same. I, I've evolved as a therapist training in a lot of different techniques because I started realizing like I like to work openly, but I specialize in trauma and addiction. You know, those are always where people will, other therapists will refer to me and therapists have come in for treatment. And, you know, I work with family members of therapists and such. But, um, you know, it depends on what people are bringing in. And I'm always evolving my technique. I've trained in more than eight different protocols for EMDR, ranging from like OCD to panic attacks to DID. Um, you know, so I, I bring in different approaches depending on what they're presenting with. And I, and I do enjoy training and training. You know, I love getting better. It's very expensive. I mean, uh, you know, my retirement don't look good right now, but I love the work and I love seeing people transform, you know, and uh, well, it, that's it makes it, me very it? much feel. Yeah. Huh? That, that's, that's the beauty about the work, the character change in a person, isn't it? That's what gives yeah. you the joy to, to sit Absolutely. with someone every day. And, and see that transformation. It, it is just amazing. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, so, some of the things that occurred to me now, you know, you, you use M E N D R. Would you just give a brief overview of now, you know, like with ISTDP, when a patient comes in or someone approaches you, 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 you use that um, ability to see where the defences are, see where their anxiety is tracking so that you can help them in that way. And then how does EMDR work in that situation then? Because that's about watching the eye movement and getting people to memorize things, isn't it? Can you give a... Uh, yeah, a, I mean, a, in a sense, EMDR stands... Yeah, yeah, Rose. EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Yeah. And that's essentially, yeah. you know, the main approach to the technique. It's been around for a few decades now, and it is psychosomatic. So it involves emotional and body uh, 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 energy or, or information. Uh, you know, at its core, it's adaptive information processing. Uh, this idea that the brain can heal itself, being stimulated through dual stimulation. Um, and the data is incredible. You know, the American Psychological and the American Psychiatric Associations hold EMDR to a gold standard with PTSD wow. and traumas. And it's been, uh, 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 it's been through many clinical trials that are um, double blind. Uh, and, and it's a beautiful approach. Like if you hear Dr. Van der Kolk from The Body Keeps the Score, he, he's been very uh, present and, uh, and verbal. EMDR, uh, he said when he first discovered it, he thought it was a joke. And then a patient came in, told him, you were working with me for four years and I never got well. And now I did EMDR for several seconds and I don't have that issue anymore. So he went and studied it. And... He's been a big proponent of EMDR. I'm and, happy to and, hear and, that. You know, you, yeah. yeah, and he's yeah. Uh, and he says it's a tool in the toolkit. You know, it's not the only tool. Yeah. And I agree. I feel like, yeah, it's not the only tool. But it's an important tool to have, especially as a trauma therapist. Like I had a patient come in to answer that, Rose, and they had an issue with um, a significant uh, um, accident that they had, and they had a challenge. And so I went and used ISTDP to work on Alliance so I can see, you know, what are the defenses and the potential for this person maybe not wanting to get well, you know, they're stating they are, but then they don't want to do the work because um, their work is painful. You're going to have to trust the therapist oh, and in the moment, yeah. build trust and alliance and tolerance to the emotion. You know, I want to test the tolerance windows so they don't have ab reactions and they don't have a bad experience um, and prep them for that. And then I, for that patient, I moved into EMDR because it was more effective than ISTDP in my professional opinion, because it had to do with uh, recent situational traumas that had PTSD effect. 
they couldn't sleep, they had challenges, there's a lot of panic involved. And they, they were regulated within two to three sessions, we got them out of that, and now they can go back to their life. You know, so EMDR is incredible. Most of the time it works within, you know, one to three to five sessions. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful technique if the therapist knows how to use it. And a lot of times, you know, it was my primary work. EMDR was one of the only tools that I, that I used the most because I loved it so much. And it was my first go-to when I first trained. Wow. Um, that can and you ISTDP. Tell, can you tell us, um, Mia would like to know, and I'm curious, how does it work and how does it look like in a session? Oh, yeah. So um, so let's say somebody comes in, I do some tests to see how do their eyes feel. You know, what is the actual tactical or tactile response I'm going to use? Will it be tapping? Because EMDR can use various forms now to create bilateral hemisphere stimulation. We want to bring, you know, the, the end result is to bring up the trauma through the lower brain and help the you know front of the brain go online so that they can start seeing through sets and sets and sets that are safe, that they're tap into the emotional uh, networks of the trauma and then also come back to reality in the present moment that they're safe right now. Are you right watching now, their you eyes know? move? They're just sitting there relaxing and you're just talking with them? Well, you know, we stimulate it. So technically they're not relaxing. They might get stimulated emotionally. And I'm tracking it with a series of numbers. I'll say zero to 10, what's your level of disturbance? You oh. know, if they're at like eight or a nine, I'm getting healthy activation at the very top of this session. So we're going to activate it. You know, if we're using the standard protocol, because there's a lot of varieties to it, but for the most part, but the, I'm but go the to person's standard. sitting there and they're just sitting, and you're are you again, are you watching something again in their face? I don't. Yeah, understand. I'm tracking their I'm tracking their wow. eye movement. Wow. Um, to be able to see, are they following me? Sometimes people will stop tracking, so I want to be able to pull their eyes back and make sure they're staying on course. You know, because that's where they're gonna. That's where the data is, and that's the reason. And I've worked with several hundred patients now and have performed uh, reprocessing of traumas, I mean, extensively, more than a few a hundred times, you know, wow. uh, extent, I mean, all throughout my week, I'm using VR and ISTDP for the most part, you know. So, um, so then I track them, I, may, I make adjustments where necessary, uh, if necessary, and then we, I'm going within an approach as I, everybody, I cater to their, but I always go over to the standard amount of sets in the very beginning, the minimal amount, and then I usually increase depending on the feedback I'm watching. Uh, I'm a person that likes to track a lot and I'll track a patient and then I'll go ahead and reflect back if I feel like, you know, maybe they have a little bit of uh, 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 resistance or they're going off. And, and so, uh, you know, if I can't get them to use EMDR work, I'll go back to ISTDP to see what's stuck. Uh, but typically I go use ISTDP for the first few sessions, get the activation, the unlocking of the unconscious. And then if I need, I'll make choices from there if I want to do EMDR or not, EMDR or, not or stay on ISTDP track. Or use a variation because some, you yeah. know, sometimes people are borderline personality type, highly mm -hmm. fragile. I find EMDR to be more effective when I'm using gentle forms of EMDR, like a, 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 a progressive protocol is a beautiful one by Dolores Mosquera. Um, and it's a very gentle approach and you kind of peel away the layers over time. It's a little longer, but it can help and they get a lot of actualization and interpersonal development. It goes at a slower pace than standard EMDR or ISTDP would, so it might end up being in therapy six months to a year, maybe two years yeah. with the patient, maybe several years, depending on their fragility. But it's exactly. safe, it's open, they start slowly transforming. And there's no right or wrong. You know, you want to go with the engine of the car, you know, let's say, not to put people are, in that are kind of idea. Are you helping to create new neuro circuits? Is that kind of what you're... Well, yes, yeah, they are moving that direction, right, where they can come back to the reality and then all the time, 90% of the time when people have reprocessed trauma and EMDR, I always watch them fade away over the session. So let's say the session is 90 minutes at the beginning. They're in the trauma. It's very intense and painful. They're crying or they're grieving or they're feeling guilt and pain. And then you go back and forth to this moment, back to the trauma, back to this moment, you know, back to whatever's coming up. We don't force them, but we are testing it to make sure that we're getting a progressive approach here as we're going forward. And then by the end, 50 minutes to 60 minute session, you know, it's beautiful when a patient's like, wow, you know, they start off at 10 out of a 10 on pain. And at the end, they're like, I'm at a three out of a 10. And it's weird. I keep looking at what I've been through. You know, I had somebody process rape recently and they would look at it, right, sexual assault. And they were able to see that they were safe right now. It was a painful event I've gone through, you know, but they don't have to live in terror or having to live in the fear that this is going to happen right now again. And make it crippling. They can't go to work, or they want to even kill themselves from the pain and the shame, you know. The, right? 
So, so then when you watch them transition and you see them come to a place of like zero out of a 10 or one out of a 10 on pain and stress and, and discomfort, and they, we can move them forward now into a reframe, you know, what we call a positive cognition. One of them would be I'm safe now. Or, or it's not my fault, you know. The, the, that person was sick, and I, and I'm and I'm okay. I have choices today, or whatever it is. That that's the reframing. We go ahead and we actually install it, and then we test it. See if their psyche attaches, and if their network moving forward further. And and that's what happens in the work they do, you know. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's very enriching experience. Like sitting on the side of it, you know. As much as I love theater, you know, I, I watch it, and it's like, wow, you get to see somebody transform in front of you. And it's gorgeous. You know, I, there was a uh, story about the man from Echo Park Lake. You know, the Echo Park is a local park where it, it was in a very challenged environment and it was a very violent neighborhood. And then some man came along and found like a lotus flower, I think, over there growing in the mud. And he was a horticulturalist. So he took that lotus. He, he stole it, actually. So it's a, it's a famous story about the horticulturalist who stole the lotus, grew hundreds of them. He brought him back and he told the city, like, hey, I have hundreds of, of authentic Echo Park, uh, which was gifted, I think, from Japan in the 1930s. And, and he said, I want to go ahead and plant. Is that OK? And then they did this big renovation project. And the lotuses are gorgeous. If you get lucky now, is you know, we don't get to see much because of COVID, but it was beautiful. But it's nice when we see a patient, you know, coming in and damaged and, and kind of, you know, in a crippling state emotionally and in pain and suffering, you know, and to be this you know, this pathway towards healing from darkness to light, you know, this rugu, what people say, guru, right? It's an ancient Sanskrit word from, from, from darkness to light, you know? And, and wow. it's a gorgeous space to be as a clinician, to be able to help somebody. And, and that's why I love training, because it's like, okay, you know, some people you can't help. Some people are very damaged and it's sad, but they can get help if they're willing to do the work, you know, or be able yeah. to try alternatives like medication, you know, and then get a little better. We're lucky we have all these options today in, in our modern world, right? And then all the holistic approaches are phenomenal because some people are going to have organic damage. You know, if they have severe schizophrenia, you can't really heal that. I mean, it's just a reality. You can medicate it and help them function, you know, and this is where, you know, some things get extreme and challenging, you know, arenas. But on the other side of it, most people can have all these plethora of choices, be it spirituality or you know, yoga and meditation or Buddhism or, you know, or 12 step work, right? You can build a community for free, right? Or that if you have access to, uh, uh, you know, if you're fluent and have access to finances or you just have access to self to wellness and care, you can go afford a therapist, afford trauma work, afford to have, uh, you know, massages and chiropractory work and, you know, all the stuff it takes to manage also this modern world, which ironically is filled with so much challenges on our body, right, on our mind and heart. Not like the old days where you can just lay back under a shade and chill out and, and you know, go into the, when you need food, you, you kind of run into the forest and, you know, you know, get what you need, right? This, this is a more complicated times. Like and the growing tree, like the growing tree, just survive with that one tree. The guy just survived with the one tree. It was an unbelievable story. You know? Ah, yeah. David, will you talk also a little bit, you know, you're talking about yeah. EMDR and going back to the trauma and also yeah. with ISTDP, like we, we actually look at the, at the triangle of conflict and the triangle of persons and a lot of people in the dialogue on the side will say, you know, we're, we're dragged back to our old trauma and, you know, how, why is that relevant or how is that relevant? Are you able to sort of talk about that in, in the in the in the model of of the work you do that we need to oh, go yeah. back to to d to you know i always sort of say well we need to comp contain it or something but you've probably got a better way of putting it than me yeah yeah well you know I, i'm training with dr john rothhauser and he's a phenomenal clinician in the istdp uh, uh, framework and like i was sharing before a graceful and, and very deep hearted clinician and I love the work that he provides. You know, I got to see a lot of his footage. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, taking away from what I've learned from the Davenlu framework through, through John's work, um, uh, you know, if we look at the, uh, at the unconscious uh, as a, uh, uh, um, uh, I, I like to say in a way it's, uh, or like a volcano, you know, it's filled with all this stuff, you know, um, with working class men, 
you know, I usually would joke and I say, it's like if you had a toilet bowl and the toilet bowl is clogged. Would you leave all that there? Right? The khara. Would you leave the khara there? You know, I work with a lot of Middle Eastern and Armenian and, and Persian and uh, Jewish, uh, 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 a lot of ethnic cultures, you know. But when a man comes in, you know, a man has a certain way of seeing things. A lot of guys, let's say. So they the, could be the most stubborn to want to get well, right? You know, but it's like if you had a toilet bowl filled with khara, are you going to leave the crap there? Or are you going to go get somebody to clean it up? So it's like, okay, in a sense, you know, I'm a partner. So here. you're a plumber. You you're a plumber. I'm like a psychic plumber. You know, this is the working class <laughs> version of my ISTDP invitation to say like, hey, let's look at this together. Right. I'm going to need your help. I can't do it without you. You know, but if you want to live like this, that's your choice. I feel for you. Well, why would you want to do this to yourself? But, um, you know, so, so, uh, Rose, when we look at it from that kind of framework, which is the unconscious, let's say it gets clogged with traumas and pain. It's painful to then be intimate if you had a parent that would not turn to you and give you the eyes of affection, love, eyes of empathy and caring, right? Every time a little kid goes, ah, ah, hundreds of times a week, not, not even in a lifetime, right? If, if I'm a parent, and I can tell you that kids from the baby on, we don't come into this world thinking intellectually and saying when we come out of the wound, that was an intense trip. Oh my God, this was really painful. <laughs> Right? What a we tunnel come in I went through, a tunnel. <laughs> right? A tunnel. Right? It's not like that at all. You know, they're committing and crying and screaming. Ah! Right? And at our core is this emotional being. And then the layers of that can get covered over, over time. Neglect, mm. avoidance, rupture after rupture. Family don't have time. Leave me alone. Go in your room. Shut up. You know, or whatever it is, that kind of pattern that's developed that the person starts unconsciously packing away their own anger and resentment and, and pain towards that, the guilt that they feel towards that, right? That can get packed, packed, packed for decades. Imagine yeah. all the defenses to keep that tucked in. They will manage, you know, that means love is not safe. Intimacy is not okay. Being affectionate is, you know, maybe a little bit, but you can't have that all the time. Somebody's going to cheat on me. Somebody's going to backstab me. Somebody's going to push me away. Somebody going to abandon me. You know, somebody's not going to love me. And in the end, they don't love themselves. You know, we end up not loving ourselves because we're trained from a young age to just go live life, survive. Forget about thriving, right? And yeah. so what happens? The unconscious, if you look at it from an ISTD framework, you know, different from EMDR, which looks more neural pathways, right? And, and memory networks. But they're almost the exact same. I mean, in the end, we're trying to relieve yeah, that which is believable. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And yeah. work to go ahead and open that up slowly and build safety yeah but this the thing is that often patients will say but why why do you want you know why why is the literature all about the past whereas i'm living in the present and that's where you know that that past story keeps on repeating itself over and over and 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 that's a sort of part of that lack of yeah, yeah, yeah. resistance you know, like resistance to change, maybe. Is that what, how would you, how would you explore that? Do you know? Do you, uh, I Irish know? proverb. Uh, I, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the Irish proverb? Irish proverb. Now I can't hear you. Uh, uh, now, you know, this, keep talking. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Past, you know, it's not in you're the going past. In, wait, uh, David, you're going in and out, so you might need both. I don't know why you're going the in and out. The battery's uh, going down on my. We don't want to miss a word. We don't want to miss a word. Okay, now say it. Can you hear me better? Can you hear me better? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Normal now. Thank you so much, and thanks for being patient out there. Um, the um, uh, you know, Irish proverb is the thing about the past. It's not in the past, right? It's not in the past, you know. And yeah, it's in uh, the and present, what happens yeah. is we can. Right, we can push it aside. That's the defense to try and avoid Good. it and resist yes. it and neglect yeah. it. Right, and and try and detach. And this is where cognitive work or spirituality can actually be, uh, you know, like a mask to what's underneath the emotional baggage and the trapped energy that's stuck and the memory networks that are that are that haven't been resolved. Uh, and that's why it's nice to get, yeah, you you know, spiritual work, mindfulness practice, cognitive approaches are crucial to living life. I mean, let's get real. <laughs> if you don't reframe challenges, you're going to live in a lot of challenge. But, um, you know, to get underneath it, 
and to let go of that which is stuck inside you, right? And to not have to be avoidant anymore and to open up the heart and to live from tender love, which is very bottom of uh, underneath the, the, the rage and neglect and the guilt and the pain is tender love. It's the softest chemical, right? If we look at it like alchemy, tender love is the softest and it's the most compressed one down. And, and our task, yeah. you know, I feel like me as a therapist, if the patient wants to go that route, some patients just want supportive therapy. And I have a, you know, a small amount that I'll sit with and support. It's not a problem. But majority of the work is, you know, we're going to get to a point of resolution and not needing therapy, you know, that you can go on in your life and be your own therapist that you've actualized and you've let go of all these blocks, right? Yeah. Well, that that's exactly what, isn't it? That it's not in the past. It's it's a current, it's a current situation that's being re, re redone. Um, Michael Galinsky has a good way of putting it that it's a um, it's a, it's the same act. Like our lives are four acts or whatever, and um, and each act has the same theme. Is that how how is that how we'd say it, Tova? <coughs> patterns. There's patterns. Yeah. Yeah. And if you notice those patterns. We we get to be able to to witness and 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 observe witness and not get caught yeah. and see yeah. if it's, is it healthy or not and how do you, you know that we, we take control you know we're talking about the brain and I love say a few words about the brain you had a nice way that you explained about this brain that we're first of all we're in charge of this brain this brain doesn't control us we control the thoughts we control the brain we are the navigator we are the conductor. Well said. Most yeah. part, you know, I think it's Rick Hansen or Dan Siegel. They talk about uh, the brain's wired towards negativity bias. You know, strife, right? The the the, the lion attack. Let's prepare it. But that can go into hyper gear uh, when we have traumas and we haven't learned how to, you know, face that which is within us, and 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 develop an executive function. You know, to make executive the front of the brain function. Strong. Very good. Right to be able to have willpower and empathy. That's where willpower and empathy lie, and the ability to foresee, you know, uh, consequences uh, that you can say, "Oh, oh I do this; it's going to lead to this." You know, and it's tough. I think a good indicator is for the people out there. You know, if they're looking at a spouse and they feel like this, they remind me of my mom or my dad. You know, then there's something to excavate and work there, right? <laughs> or uh, bingo, uh, right, right there. Good, the good diagnostic, self-diagnostic self-diagnostic feature, or if they're single and they can't stay being in relationships, right? That they hate people or hate intimacy. It's like, okay, well, you know, it's something to be open to look at if you want, you know, if it's causing you suffering, right? If it's not, then why change anything? If you're doing okay, you're doing okay. Nothing to change. But, you know, if you're suffering, then that's a red flag to start looking and, and be courageous, you know, to face that which is inside. It's not that scary. You know, somebody was sharing earlier to, um, Kiss the dragon on the nose is like a Chinese philosophy, I think. You know, like to face face that which we run away from. Um, you know, and that's part of ISTDP is to face what we're avoiding, right? And open that up and walk through it. You know, like yeah. exposure therapy, right? You're going to face it and walk through it, and then eventually, like, okay, this is actually nothing to be scared of, and it might even become a conf. I've seen so many people gain strength, and you know, I've been kind of fortunate to work with famous people or NASA scientists or, you know, different uh, engineers at different levels, you know, and to watch them transform with, when people have a very strong executive functioning to come into the work with, sometimes it's a lot more comprehensible for them. They kind of absorb quickly the information. They could be that student that I was sharing, like the Patanjali idea, you know, like they can hit the first chapter and be like, okay, I see the direction going and boom, you know, they don't, they're low resistance. Right, low yeah. resistance. But yeah, when they're the coming monster, in with the some monster more traumas, under the bed, the monster under the bed is a very lovable monster. Yeah, unless you're five you know, years old. It depends on what they're looking at. I mean, if you look at incest survivors, that's a painful one because it's the parent that molested them, right? Right. If you, they've been molested extensively too, that's a that's a painful dragon to have to face. And and that's yeah. and I and I empathize for that one, you know, and I hold compassion, not to stop yeah. there, you know, to still walk through it with the right clinician. And to heal through that, because it's healable, right? I, and I've seen it with my own eyes. That's why I'm a fan. It's like, no, no, it takes work. If you want to, if you're obese and you decide to get healthy, give it a few years if you've reached that amount of weight, right? 
that, it, that you're gonna have to switch things around and you can do it. I think it was Brene Brown, you know, I'll end with this. Brene Brown, right? She had this beautiful thing I was hearing her share about, uh, uh, you know, either way, you're gonna end up a few years from now. So why not take care of it now? Like I'm gonna be there in several years, right? Without a degree or with a degree, with trauma, or without trauma. What am it I is, gonna it is about for? loving, isn't it about loving the monster and loving the the dragon in the monster? It's about it's about acceptance. I mean, it's really about acceptance. Yeah, yeah. right. Coming to that place of, of ultimate mm -hmm. acceptance, which is like this happened to me. It's very painful. I can walk through this now, and then come through the yeah. other side of it, which is I saw that, and, and I'm healed today. I don't have to live from that frame anymore. There's so many people that do the work and they're very courageous. And you know, for those who choose not to, I mean, it's like, you know, it's, a, it's a, I, my compassion for them. I hope and pray that they will be open, you know, and, and it's hard, it's not, you know, it's hard. It's not easy work to do, but why stay yes. stuck? Like, what is that, kind of, what is that, where's the payoff there? Right. Yeah. Do, well, do you, you know, know, yeah, go ahead, Rose. I often, think, has to go I, in a few often, minutes. Okay, I often think about in, in that regard is that um, when, when, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, and you know, like people come to want to come to therapy, but then um, change their mind or block it or whatever. I often think instead of thinking it's a failure, that uh, I think that they're not ready yet. They're not ready. Yes. The motivation maybe isn't there, not or they've now. been sent by someone yeah. else, not or yet. not now, or not with me, yeah. or all of those other components. But if if they're open to it the teacher will appear at the right time. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's for us as clinicians and craftspeople to hone out the arts that we need to get better. You know, I like to remind my work is like, oh, you know, maybe that if I did something different there, you know, let me see, where's my gap? I like to videotape my foot, my work so I can see, you know, where's the gap? Where can I get better? What's the improvement area? Kind of like working like a, a healing athlete, you know, like a, there's an athletic component to wanting to, change as a clinician and advance our work um and it's a beautiful you know place to be as a clinician i i feel mm -hmm. like clinicians should keep mm -hmm. working on themselves in therapy and out clinically and absolutely. Technically. All, the time. absolutely all the time absolutely david I, I know you have to go and so i want to say to our yeah, listeners um first of all we're going to show this video in the next couple of days on our tms roundtable and on our youtube to if people want to contact you or get some questions or get some clarification, you know, I'll, I can you'll you'll let me know and I can maybe send them your email or um, and you'll invite right everyone for dinner. Want. The whole community will come and have a meal. <laughs> <laughs> well, counseling a Middle 